Okay, uh, so welcome again to this last uh, Austro-Belgian meeting. And uh, our first uh, speaker today is uh, Kevin uh, Chavard, uh, <clears throat> who is uh, currently um, a PhD student at the CFSS, uh, funded by uh, FNRS, uh, the Belgian Research Ag Agency. And uh, uh, as uh, uh, you know, uh, he uh, did physics before uh, coming to philosophy. So his topic is, uh, there is no problem of time or change in general relativity. And uh, Kevin, we are happy to have you uh, here and please uh, start your talk. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for being here. So as Valeria said, it's my first talk in this kind of research meeting. So if I'm a bit nervous and I'm Eating my words, don't hesitate to stop me so that I can speak a bit more slowly and more articulated. So um, yes, I'm, P I'm a new PhD student from Alexander, and I'm working on the role, role and representation of time and change in contemporary physics, more specifically in the transition from regional relativity to LQG, so loop quantum gravity and quantum gravity in general. So for this talk, I propose to defend the change in general relativity. Uh, against mostly against um, Herman's uh, article from 2002, which is called Fully Modern MacTaggart. So, um, yeah, wait, uh, okay. so that will be the outline of my talk. First, I will just generally present some ideas about um, philosophy of time and why one would defend change in the physics of philosophy of physics for people who are maybe not um, aware of this kind of stuff. Then I will be presenting the formalism that is the main argument from Yaman's article against change. And I will uh, open up in the last session to, uh, toward uh, more conceptual tools that, uh, that allows one, that could allow one to have real genius, genuine change in general relativity. So to start with, uh, my main uh, commitment is that I'm following Aristotle in saying that Time is something of change. So the prime, uh, fundamental concept is that time is change for me, and time is built up from change. So um, the main vocabulary that is used in physics of time, uh, in physics at least, is MacTaggart's vocabulary. So there is two ways to define uh, properties of uh, change as property in a metaphysics of time, either in a tensed way, so saying that there exist uh, properties of fastness, futility, and presentness, and that uh, one goes from one to the other in a traditional change way. But the, the change that is mostly defined in physics is mostly the B series, so a tenseless um, account of time, which says that um, change and uh, time is only the relationship between two events of being later than or being earlier than. So that's the densest way to see change, and that's the one that uh, Hermann and a lot of physicians of physics thinks is the only one that you can find in physics, actually. But uh, I want to just uh, briefly say and uh, point out that for both of these uh, account of time and change, the main uh, concept is events and not things, and uh, that will be uh, relevant for the last part of my talk. So why would one defend the change in physics uh, in a more personal way? I may be wrong. Maybe I don't know physics that well, but uh, I guess that uh, with defining change is recovering the idea, common idea that physics is a science of how things change uh, with dynamics and mechanics. Uh, another idea, a more philosophical one, is that um, from a perpetual realist point of view, uh, uh, we want to have an account of change in physics that is more or less tied to the one that you could have in, in phenomenology and uh, the way you would experience change in time. Because uh, for me, the, the point, like uh, my commitment is that we all experience change and uh, there is some reality to change them. We all grow up, we all die, so there must be change somewhere. And if, if there is no change in physics, maybe we should ask ourselves why, and uh, if it's necessary or if, if it can be recovered. And in a more um, epistemological sense, uh, epistemological motivation to different change and time in physics is that you may have issue with empirical incoherences in physics if you don't have change and time in your ontology. So it was, it's a concept that was defined uh, by uh, Jeff Barrett 
in the quantum mechanics of mind and world in 1999. And you have the citation of the definition, a theory is empirically incoherent in case, in case the truth of theory undermines our empirical justification for believing it to be true. So basically it has uh, experiences and uh, other way to test theories. So to have reasons to believe our theories are true, are uh, taken place in space and time, it, uh, mostly time, it will be um, an issue if uh, the theory tells us that we have no change in time, because then if the ontology is, so is changeless and timeless, you would have uh, an issue with how to fit experiments and measure inside the theory to test it to be true or not, which may be an issue for further quantum gravity stuff. And um, if we if we believe then that uh, uh, that the theories are changeless and timeless, I guess uh, we are hold some explanation on why, because as I said, uh, that's a common experience to to experience change in time. So at least if you want to defend that there is no time and no change, maybe tell us how uh, we have the illusion, illusion of this thing being true or being existing. So <clears throat> now I will turn toward uh, uh, the article from Herman and the main argument I will be defending against. So as a general uh, introduction to the formalism that is the main point of argument from Herman, which is called constraint Hamiltonian formalism. So it's a formalism that was uh, developed by Dirac in the, in the middle of the 19th century as a way to have a quantization, quantization processus that would allow um, to have quantization for more complex dynamics than just the um, usual um, quantum mechanics. Uh, is someone asking something? So, um, so, yeah. so why would one want to use this formalism for general relativity? So the main use of this formalism in uh, contemporary physics is for the research toward quantum gravity when you start with general relativity. Because um, if you use the usual uh, Hamiltonian uh, quantization, you would find actually that the Hamiltonian is null and so you have no dynamics. And if you want to go a bit further than that and see uh, and uh, code dynamics uh, in another way, you have to use the constraint Hamiltonian formalism, which uh, encode the, dynamis, the dynamics, not in the Hamiltonian, but in the constraints on the phase space uh, of your theory. And so it, for, for, for quantum gravity, it's a necessary step to go all the way with that. But for Mark Foreman in the, his article from 2002, there is another point of uh, this formalism, which is not directly linked to the um, quantum gravity stuff. It's more to have um, a way to uh, erase some indeterminism that would uh, arise from the, theory, from the general relativity, relativity theory and um, mostly with the concept of general covariance, which is which means, uh, I, I think I, I've written it somewhere, okay. so maybe not. But general covariance is basically the idea that um, you can take uh, the, any uh, equation, dynamical equation of Einstein's field equation, and if you uh, transform them uh, through diffeomorphism, space-time diffeomorphism, you would have uh, invariance basically because in, uh, the, Space-time diffeomorphisms are a gauge group for the models of relativistic theory, a general relativistic theory. And um, that's uh, the way uh, Ehrman talked about it is basically another way to uh, you to describe the whole argument, which was an argument that was uh, used by Einstein in 1913 and was then uh, redesigned by uh, Hermann and uh, John Norton and John Stachem uh, in a way to um, fight against substantivalism. So basically the whole argument goes that uh, if you take a space-time with uh, coordinates and you define a region of space-time where you use a diffeomorphism to uh, transform the region of space-time, so the whole, you would have an issue with um, predicting how the field will evolve in this uh, whole because uh, everything else would be exactly the same as before and you would have a smooth transition to the whole so that there is actually an issue with determinism of the field uh, evolution inside this whole. And that's another way to see covariance, uh, general covariance in a more active way. 
So um, this indeterminism are good, uh, I gauge uh, freedom things. And uh, Herman is especially uh, against that in his article. He's saying, uh, so you have a quote, uh, in a theory with gauge, with gauge freedom, what is real or objective is what remains after the, gauge, the gauge freedom is known. Sorry for my French. So, <clears throat> so for him, it's necessary to, uh, to erase this determinism so that uh, your theory is um, uh, more coherent. And the way to do so is through this um, constraint and formalism that was designed for quantum gravity to start. Oh more quantum stuff. So how does it work uh, in Herman's article at least? So uh, the start of the thing is to transform your usual formalism of GR, which is a Lagrangian one, into a Hamiltonian one. And when you do so, you see that uh, because of the general covariance of the theory, you have dependency in the phase space coordinates that just naturally can from the transformation. Then you define this dependency as the primary constraints. So the constraints uh, that will be uh, coding the dynamics. And from this primary constraint, you single out one family of them, which is called the first class constraints, and are defined by uh, their commutation with all the other constraints you can find. So, um, following, if you, if you follow the usual formalism from Dirac, um, then you propose that um, the observable and the good are the gauge transformation. Um, sorry that the gauge transformation are the ones that are given by the first class constraints transformation. So that um, basically when you have two points of phase space that are connected by a gauge transformation, actually they are the same physical space. So the transformation doesn't code anything physical, it's a mainly a mathematical uh, surplus of structure. So then um, the, the way in this constraint formalism that you define the uh, observable is by defining them against uh, among the gate invariant quantities so that you have then a deterministic evolution because then you, are on the, you have taken out all the mathematical surplus and you, all, all that remain is deterministic stuff with only one uh, orbit in phase space. But when you do that, actually, since the Hamiltonian constraint it, uh, which code uh, the dynamics are among um, the first class constraints, so you're observable, but you just defined, maybe deterministic, but actually there are constants of motion. So uh, you wanted to uh, go further than frozen dynamics with the usual Hamiltonian, but you get again some kind of frozen dynamics if you want to uh, conserve determinism in uh, this way. So um, now we have seen, so there is, uh, Herman's proposition is actually more um, a trade-off between determinism and change, and you have to choose basically which one you prefer best. And it's not really like a rejection uh, per se of becoming like a, uh, in itself. It's a really trade off between both first, both stuff. Well, obviously he's defending determinism, so he's rejecting um, change in the end. But, uh, so um, I, I, I want to claim that uh, from following others that have said so, Bodling, Dix, and uh, Heli, uh, mainly, but uh, actually you are not forced to take this uh, Hamiltonian trap, as I said, right? maybe a bit mean, but you're, you're not forced to, there are different strategy to do so. Herman's strategy is uh, to recognize internism as a real physical stuff and uh, real mathematical stuff that you, can, that you need to uh, get rid of so that you get uh, real uh, physical stuff. And uh, so you go from theory towards the ontology and that's Herman's strategy, but as Modin said in his response to uh, Herman's, which is called for the model Mark Taggart, but I didn't put the year, but it's the same year. So there are actually, actually three different strategies that you can uh, adopt in front of this indeterminism. So either you go the Herman's way and you can quotient the phase space. So quotienting is uh, uh, how you define the, um, the observable as constant motion. Uh, yeah, I should have maybe put it before. Um, so you get uh, uh, at the end uh, only uh, one gauge orbit and you have a tidy determinism, but no change. Or you can also accept that uh, there is indeterminism in your formalism as a real uh, property of your uh, theory. It's, it's possible if you're an instrumentalist, for example. Or you can do another thing and you can say that uh, there is a gauge that you can choose to, uh, to avoid 
having to do the quotienting, quotienting uh, for the phase space. And so to avoid uh, having to take um, uh, the changes trade off uh, for determinism. So the first two possibilities are the two sides of the trade off moments, but uh, the one that we'll be following is mostly uh, along the side of the third um, possibility. And uh, I, I want to, to show, uh, I will do so quickly because I don't know if I have a lot of time, but um, I want to show that um, if you define change as a local stuff and you start that from the idea that change is, you can actually um, have no issue uh, having prediction and determinism in, your, um, in what you do with your uh, theory. So um, there, I just put like a quickly for again for some or maybe not um, uh, as inclined in the philosophy of physics and time, but um, there is a way to fix this gauge globally, uh, which when you go to cosmology and you say that in cosmology your universe is basically homogeneous and isotropic, so um, you can define an average in a co which we call a cohomological time. So it's a time that is defined uh, in average for the, the global time function for the whole universe. But um, I have to point out that I, I don't really like this kind of uh, solutions because um, uh, there are highly idealized models and in real life your universe is never homogeneous or isotropic. Well, at least maybe like if you, if you have a statistically, if you go to infinite maybe for the average. But uh, so I propose to do the, the reverse, not look for a global time function, but look at a local a time function that is actually a byproduct of change. And I think that uh, by looking at change as a primary stuff and not to time, actually it's more easy to see how it would be local because change is something that uh, is a property of objects that uh, undergo a change in the space time and endure. And um, this idea of having a local change is also something that is. Uh, Quite common for uh, people who do relativistic stuff because you have uh, which is which is called the twin paradox, which is basically the famous uh, thought experiment where you send two twins in two different uh, spaceships at different speed, and you can see that one will age faster than the other. So, change is um, something that you experience locally, and there is no real reason why uh, change needs to be something global if it's uh, just relativity of similarity. So. Everything is experienced locally, and it's uh, actually more um, preferable to define change in local way. And anyway, when you do any test of theory, so to ward off uh, possibility of empirical incoherence that would uh, come out from the Hermann solution, because Hermann is uh, committed to changeless, um, or at least uh, not in the issue, not in the representation of the uh, observable. And um, so, um, sorry, <laughs> excuse me. So uh, yeah, uh, any uh, test that you will do of a theory will be a local uh, measure because uh, you're doing stuff locally and or you're defining uh, locally a, a, a gauge that is the foliation space and that is based on your point of view. And uh, it's, it, it is coinciding with our experience of time because our experience of time is local. So why should we have um, global change? There is actually no reason. And uh, if we take the local change, if everything goes well. So I don't see any point in trying to have um, global change. So my, my, my strategy is actually a one that is um, quite close to both Healy and Dix, uh, which is to uh, look at local um, properties, uh, local change, and uh, having a good choice to define uh, a gauge locally when you do a uh, measure or experiments and you try to use your theory basically. So there is no real issue with, uh, with locality, uh, with a local change of uh, any uh, epistemological issue. Um, so I, I've put two quotes from Millie and Dix that, um, that are quite close to what I claim, what, what I want to, to defend. So in uh, his article of 2004, which is called uh, Change Without Change, he is saying that these restrictions, so the restriction of on what an observable is in, in uh, general relativity, 
seem justified only as long as one ignores the fact that genuine change in a relativistic world is frame dependent. So it depends on the local frame that you define. Train change is a significant and observable feature of the general, of the general relativistic world only because our situation in such a world naturally picks out a given class of frames. And Dix from 2005, which is uh, becoming relatively in a locality, the name of the article, our experience does not support the existence of global simultaneity and arguments from modern physics, further support the conclusion that time should not be seen as a succession of cosmic now. Accordingly, I propose that if we want to make sense of becoming, we should attempt to interpret it as something purely local. Um, I don't know how many times I have left. Maybe 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Oh, well, a lot more than I thought. Okay. Um, so now we have uh, seen that uh, if, uh, in front of Fairman's uh, article, if you want to define change, we have to define it locally so that we have no issue with uh, empirical incoherence or other things. So, so I, I want to explore what I'm doing right now in uh, my, phys my physics, actually, which is uh, looking at uh, more conceptual uh, analysis of change to secure genuine change and not like just mere change or difference or other kind of change that we will maybe see later. So um, the, the main issue that I take with uh, the way uh, change and time are discussed in the relativistic uh, frameworks is uh, actually primacy of events. Uh, we, we look at change and time through events. And it's something that uh, Herman explicitly says in, that, in his article. So he says, uh, as quoted, space time points and regions are the only obvious candidates for the subject role in, G in GTR. Uh, it's related to change, subject to change. But it's a fundamental issue because um, in, in, in uh, relativistic physics, events are defined as space, as space time points. And uh, a point cannot have uh, any extension, and so if it is, if it has no extension, um, I don't see why uh, you can, how you could find change in that is not extended because change requires a lapse of time to pass by. So, if you have non-extended non-extended points, are you, as your subject of change, obviously you will never find change, real change, or genuine change, as you prefer. And um, I, I propose that um, actually the issue uh, in uh, relativistic, one of the issues in relativistic, uh, philosophy of relativistic uh, theories is that we tend to, um, to uh, conflate both MacTaggart's events and uh, the way we define, define events in, um, in physics. So MacTaggart's events, analysis uh, of event, is not necessarily a point event. Uh, and uh, so, if you allow events to have some kind of um, extension, you can find change, which is not the case with points uh, events. So despite the fact that um, both vocabulary looks quite similar, actually, it's, it's, uh, I think there is an issue here. So uh, oh, that's, what I, that's what I just said. So change is, uh, is commonly taken as a property of objects, so I've seen as things that endure and have some temporal extension and not the point stuff event. So uh, there is a real issue there, and uh, that's why I think uh, the hat hat or cinematographical theory of change is actually so um, popular in the physics of physics. So this uh, theory of change is uh, one that was uh, developed mainly by uh, Russell in the start of the 20th century. And um, it, is, um, it is a theory that is uh, designed with uh, the idea that uh, change is just the property of object having different, just the fact that objects have different properties that are incompatible at different time, instant of time. But then you see that there is an issue because I, it's in the name cinematographical theory of change. So it's a, it's a theory of change that takes as change uh, different uh, lab, different instances that are just uh, so just juxtaposed, so just in succession, one to, to one another, and uh, that uh, in the clear article uh, from uh, 1990, which is called "Difference Between Real Change and Electronic Cambridge Change," is basically just Cambridge change. It's not genuine change. 
because then you treat it uh, as if it were made up of temporary ordered sequence of intrinsically static states. So you have different uh, points that are just su in succession to one another, and there is no uh, real relations and no real uh, incentive to go from one point to the other. So there is no real change. You just have different static stuff that are not real change. And it's quite close actually to um, Bergson's insight uh, that uh, there is a real issue in physics with the specialization of space, uh, of, of time. Uh, so if there is an issue, there is a mistake here. Yeah. It would be specialization of time. Uh, there is a question. Do I, do I take the question now or do I wait? Oh, no, okay. It's just, uh, okay. So um, if you want to um, defend. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah. Brian, do you want to add something now or you uh, just wanted to give us references? If this were just references uh, to what you were saying, so let's uh, continue then. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't uh, used your uh, article, uh, Mr. Pitts. <laughs> I, I know that you wrote something on that, uh, but uh, for purpose of time, I didn't uh, include it. Yeah. Um, one, so if you want to defend uh, the cinematographical uh, uh, account of time, you could always say that um, actually you have some incentive in physics to go from one point to the other, which is the instantaneous velocity. Which you can you could define as a propensity to um, go from one state to the other, and mathematically it is well defined. But um, there is an issue there that is related to my uh, last point. That uh, actually uh, the way to define it is by taking the limits from smaller and smaller intervals that are being centered around the instant at which you want to define your instantaneous linearity. So it's actually not really the property of the instant; it's uh, just a limit of uh, different. Um, extended uh, interval. So now um, the issue I think uh, I claim is that um, actually you, the mathematical uh, formalism that uh, physics has used uh, for the last century actually is cannot uh, take into account genuine change because in the same way cannot take into account genuine continuum. Uh, what you get, uh, what you what you define mathematically, uh, since uh, the in the contour and the others, is you define the uh, sequence of infinite, infinite sequence or infinite uh, series of points, in, uh, in extended points, that make up a continuous line. But that is uh, actually not a real math, uh, metaphysical continuum. It's uh, something that is uh, broken, and uh, you cannot make something truly continuous outside uh, out of uh, an inextended stuff and uh, to my to, to, to what I'm doing right now is just looking at um, how much um, how necessary it is to define a continuum that way in uh, contemporary physics, because uh, there is different uh, way to do that to do to to look at um, uh, change in a continuous way. Uh, you could say also that you have an extent present uh, in uh, shifting those or moving spotlight uh, scheme that are uh, already uh, quite um, uh, well reflected upon. But uh, this kind of uh, scheme had metaphysical uh, entities on top of uh, um, of mathematical structure and uh, it's uh, not necessary, I think. Uh, so now what I want to, to show actually in my project, uh, my physics project for the last month, the next month, I don't know, next year maybe, is uh, to show that actually Maybe we can have another mathematical formalism that would be more true to our, um, our intuition of what the, of a true continuous and thus uh, that could uh, reason to more or truthfully change, which will be based on the infinity, infinitesimal. So you have a lot of mathematical development that have been done in the end of the, 90, of the 20th century on uh, this kind of stuff. And um, one, of, one of this mathematical development is using category theory. To uh, implement infinitesimal, so that you uh, cannot um, cut a real, a real line into an instance, you are forced to have um, some extension, and uh, you cannot define truly a uh, extension with uh, well-defined limits, so that you don't have instant at the, as, as limits of of uh, intervals either. Uh, so the one uh, I think has the most uh, chance to actually uh, work out uh, if you if you want to. Um, 
that uh, replace mathematics uh, that are used today with uh, more continuous mathematics is uh, the smooth infinitesimal analysis, which is also called synthetic differential geometry. So why is it uh, the one that I'm uh, looking at the most right now is because actually uh, not so long ago, there were a lot, uh, there, were, there was a quite good um, book that was developed on how to take, you know, to, to do differential geometry on manifolds with synthetic differential geometries. So as it is the tool, manifolds is the tool for uh, relativistic physics, uh, most of them, I think there's the most uh, chance to at least bring out something and uh, maybe show that uh, we are not necessarily forced to take instant uh, into our uh, mathematical baggage. And also, so I have yet to uh, look very further into that, but I have found some article as well who uh, claim to have found some way to, uh, to read, read, uh, redo uh, generativity or quantum field theories uh, in this uh, framework of mathematics. So in a way to uh, add a really continuous uh, line. So um, as a send off for the next speaker, uh, they asked me to do so. So I'm sorry, I haven't done a lot of it because it's supposed to be the end of my thesis, but uh, just quickly, I, it, the, the transition from uh, generativity to quantum gravity is actually quite interesting as a case study for emergence, because um, as I've defended the change for, uh, for uh, classical, at classical level for generativity, I believe that uh, for quantum gravity, it's not as easy. And uh, actually, there is a good chance that uh, actually there is no space time uh, in, the, in the sense that we think of in uh, the quantum level, at the quantum level. So it poses a question of uh, emergence of space time, actually. And uh, we usually talk about emergence in the, we, we categorize emergence as either synchronical or diachronical. So we categorize emergence uh, with respect to time. And uh, here we are talking about the emergence of time itself. So we cannot really do so. And uh, we have to think again uh, how, what kind of emergence, what type of emergence uh, would be fit for this kind of uh, two-level structure. So at the end of my talk. OK, thank you very much. Um, OK. <laughs> uh, yeah, you want to? Um... To return to some slide or stop sharing your screen as you prefer. You know, it's uh, I just had to. Is it? Come on. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, some persons are happy, and me too. Uh, so, now uh, please uh, say anyone if you have questions. Otherwise, uh, while persons are reflecting, uh, let's, um, yeah, let's have some discussion. Uh, so, uh, so uh, yeah, so I'll just please say it in uh, the chat or raise your hand. Uh, okay, so Kevin, uh, I had the, um, the presentation was interesting, uh, but uh, um, as I, my organizer, I should also uh, uh, look for other things. Uh, so, uh, in this uh, position, I should say that your slides are not uh, uh, informative enough because there are too much text and it will help to have shorter phrases and uh, they shouldn't be uh, phrases from a text, but uh, they, they should be like statements uh, or maybe parts of statements or maybe even some schemes uh, that would help to understand. Uh, especially as you were saying yourself, uh, you're speaking quickly. And, uh, yeah, since, and since we are limited in time, is it appropriate to critique the, the uh, Alexander, if you have uh, questions about the I, 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 content. I have, a, I have a question for, for Kevin. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I, I, it, it's, it's, it's on that slide, so it's, it's fine. Um, First of all, many thanks, Kevin, for, for the talk. It was very, very interesting, very, very stimulating, many stuff to discuss. Now, I, I, I was just wondering, uh, in, 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 the first, in the first point, you said that uh, to add some, I mean, in, in this the discussion about the relation between change and time, and when, when it comes to generativity and quantum gravity, it seems that we need some 
metaphysical stuff or metaphysical structure to to try to figure out how these two notions can be uh, can can fit together in this very weird and strange framework. So, but in 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 this first point, you said that adding some metaphysical structure it seems to need to add uh, non-necessary metaphysical entities. And I, I was wondering, what do you mean by, by that? Why the, they, they are not necessary? Because it seems that at some point we need it. We, we need to say something. Yeah, it's a seem to be a particular case in which we need to add something to try to link this thing together. But probably I, I, am, I, I am wrong, so I would like to hear why do you think that it's not necessary to add some metaphysical structure to try to combine uh, uh, time and change in this particular framework? Yeah, thank you for the question. So, yeah, I guess it was just uh, badly written. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, what, what I want to say is that um, if you have a cinematograph cinematographical account of change that uh, works well for the ontology of physics and for the mathematics you are doing, um, adding uh, the shifting now is adding uh, issue, metaphysical issues that are not necessary. Because if you had a shifting now stuff, you have to ask uh, the rate of uh, becoming that is your shifting now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not necessary to have this uh, shifting now on top of mathematical structure if you can actually okay. reform the mathematical structure so that you can re represent the change in a more um, natural way, I say. Okay, okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that Alexander raised uh, his hand, but I, I have another question, but I, I can't wait. Okay, let's continue with Alexander and then I turn to Christian. Um, thank you, Kevin. Um, at the end, you 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 plan to, to to explore a new mathematics, new kind of mathematics to to have a better tool to think about change and especially uh, about continu continuous, which is very Aristotelian, by the way. But but a formalism at best will help you to think, but it, a formalism cannot solve a metaphysical question. So, so at the end, this formalism, how do you plan to interpret it? Will you, will you put some modality, like some, some philosopher try to say, you know, a position, there's no instant, but you can think about the position and instantious position as where you would have been if you had stopped or something like that. And the, the, the metaphysical interpretation is in the model claim about the line, the point on the line, or, or do you think this, this kind of mathematics will really get you to something else, to something new? Well, um, in this um, tentative to have representation of change in physics, uh, what, I, what I want to, to show is that um, the points that you use in uh, the ontology of points in uh, relativistic physics is not necessary. So you can do mathematics without the idea of um, well-defined extension as points. Um, I, I don't know. Um, okay, so, so you want to go against some kind of indispensability argument that we have in the back of our mind? Where... Yeah, uh, basically I, I want to... to what I don't like in uh, the discussion uh, right now is that we are talking about uh, events and at best we are talking about object as a series of events. And then uh, what you have uh, mathematically is uh, what uh, Bergson was against basically. And uh, I, I would like to see if um, you can have overrepresentation of uh, physics or manifolds that um, don't uh, have this specialization of time and uh, as necessary uh, condition to have a metaphysical, uh, physical, no, uh, meta mathematical um, presentation. Okay, uh, Christian, uh, do you have a question or no longer? Christian, if not, uh, sorry, no, no it, it's fine because there are, there are other, other people that uh, raised their hands on. I, I can wait. I think that uh, Brian uh, wants to make a question. So Yeah, let's continue with Brian because he will yeah. be after us. So Brian, please ask your question. Sorry to disappear. I had a computer problem. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. 
Uh, it's uh, it's an important topic, and I, I think you're quite ambitious, if I may uh, suggest that, to look uh, for change at particular points. But if you're content with having different properties at different times as a definition for change, as uh, is, uh, probably as many people settle for, then I think uh, a local definition is already available in terms of the absence of time like killing vector field. So. Uh, I think I put that in the chat somewhere. Uh, so I, I think in, if you merely want to respond to Ehrman, I think that there are lots of ways that, you know, th there are many things that one should not say that he says, uh, although of course he didn't invent any of them. They're quite widely received. So I, I think you could find change without having to, uh, to do any new differential geometry. I mean, which doesn't mean you shouldn't do any new differential geometry, but it's, it's you know, I think the classical stuff will do. Uh, uh, for, for at least some of the things that you're, you're interested in. Okay, th thank you for the comments. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. Uh, the, the thing is, um, um, I, 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 would, uh, um, I would have liked to um, keep the Bergson uh, definition of change, uh, um, to have a mathematical representation of change that is as close to but you can find Bergson over a more continuous or Aristotelian way of change to define change. So that's why I'm looking in this um, direction. But um, yeah, yeah, I remember that it's, uh, it's very ambitious because then uh, to use this kind of math calcul, you have to, to abandon the law of physical middle and to abandon soft part of mathematics. So I don't know exactly how it will end up. But uh, yeah, if, uh, yeah, I could be less ambitious. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if I've uh, responded to your points. Or... Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, so, Christian, uh, now finally, please ask a question. Yeah. If, if there is not any more. Any, I any have more. question after us, but I. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, I, I would like to, to hear what you think about, about the following, because at some point, one of the one of your more general argument is that I think that it was more more uh, in the beginning of your talk. Just you said that um, physics is about change, or physics is about uh, matter uh, changing or matter in space time or whatever. And this this I mean this is really very interesting and because it sounds like a normative claim, in in the sense that whatever we call physics should be about change. So if you Propose a theory that is not about change, where you have to some to some way uh, to change it because physics is by definition about change and sounds like a normative claim and sounds pretty much like, for example, people working on quantum mechanics and propose this for, uh, primitive ontology or local variables uh, stuff. They also, in some way or another, think that okay, physics is about three-dimensional stuff. So if you come up with wave function or stuff in high dimensional space, well, okay, you have to get, get rid of the stuff because physics is about uh, three dimensional stuff. So in, in this way, you are writing a similar argument. I mean, it probably is, it's in the background, but the idea is that no, it's a normative claim saying physics is about change. So if you have a theory that uh, do it without change, well, probably it's not a very good physics. And just, I, I would like to hear you if you really think if you really think something like, like this, and or why do why did you say that physics is about change or physics is about, uh, uh, yeah, that. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, it's true that uh, Alexander wanted me to not to write that. <laughs> so yeah, um, uh, yeah, is that normative chain? Um, Maybe uh, it's more like the idea that uh, I had when I was doing physics, actually, that uh, physics is the science of how things change, because that's uh, how it's presented uh, for students when you talk about dynamics, you're talking about things changing. But it's true that you can, uh, you can also define uh, the general utility as something that is the, geometric, the geometrical theory and not a dynamical one. But um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I think physics is always about uh, how things evolve and change, um, things being, uh, non-living things, or well, at least uh, things that uh, evolve naturally. Uh, yeah, I guess it's an emotive claim, yes, I guess. Uh, I haven't thought out maybe too much about that, I should have, 
maybe. Sorry about that. But, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, that, that, that's very interesting. Okay. Um, so we still have some time for questions. Uh, so if one wants, uh, please raise your hand. But uh, in the meantime, um, so, so uh, no, as part we'll start uh, at 16, uh, but uh, normally we don't have a break, but we can make one minute if needed. Uh, okay, so um, um, yes, I will ask my question. Uh, so two, two things, uh, so Kevin, uh, it was not for nothing that I said I didn't understand. Uh, the sites were not convenient for me to grasp the contents. I would still, it would be a pity to like finish your presentation without understanding what you were actually uh, claiming. So first, uh, did I understand well or not uh, that your um, your proposals are basically to, to fix uh, the cage locally and to to, to uh, abandon this idea of uh, something temporarily extended as a sequence of uh, of, uh, of states as uh, something continuous. So this uh, like uh, is your proposal uh, the combination of these two ideas, or have I missed something? And the uh, uh, second question is more interesting. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I, my understanding of the problem of time, uh, uh, which is not, uh, I, I know about this problem. I haven't worked on it, uh, so. But I have an understanding, which is that persons uh, perhaps conflate different time transformations. So there is uh, a kind of, uh, uh, statement that uh, you cannot um, then then uh, that uh, the way uh, you index time should not uh, influence on your dynamics. So if I say that now it's like uh, almost sixteen hours in Europe, but if I was elsewhere, I would say it's almost fifteen or it's almost seventeen, whatever. So this should not influence uh, your physics and your phenomena. Uh, this is one kind of transformation. It replaces the origin of uh, some uh, event, or like uh, the beginning of neuron preservation or whatever. This is one kind of transformation. And this uh, should be incorporated. I mean, all these transformations are between, uh, it's almost 15, it's almost 16, it's almost 17. These all uh, uh, beginnings of uh, some events should be identified. But there is another uh, transformation, which is, so uh, we start with uh, some presentations and you, you put one side and you put another. Okay, so you are within some kind of extended event and there you have a sequence of uh, different states. So these states should not be identified. So there are these two transformations and I think the problem of that, it seems to me that it partly comes from just conflating them. So, uh, I mean, the fact that you have identified transformations uh, uh, about what is the real hour in which you begin your presentation, it doesn't need, it means that you need to identify the, the, the states within your presentation. So you could still have dynamics insofar as uh, you do not uh, like uh, collapse your symmetry uh, within your presentation, but uh, you will also have the, abs the absence of indeterminism because you will have identified uh, this different time transformations about the beginning of your presentation. So uh, what do you think of this kind of solution? Um, I will answer your first question because I'm not sure I understood well your second one. The first one, so you asked me uh, what I'm defending exactly. So yeah, I'm defending uh, firstly that uh, change is local notion and that uh, time is a notion that is built on this local change so that you have a proper time as actually a real time defended, uh, built on the change. And uh, in, a, in the second claim, I'm exploring um, uh, other, other aspects of change that I think are necessary to have genuine change because I, I, I'm not uh, satisfied with the cinematographical account of change in physics. And so I'm claiming, yes, that um, uh, we should go uh, be in, beyond the instantaneous uh, account of events that are just succession of events because I don't think it's uh, genuine change. Um, and your second question, I'm not quite sure I've understood what you meant. 
Uh, so uh, yeah, we'll also have a question from Brian, uh, but just to finish uh, quickly. Uh, so <clears throat> I propose to distinguish between two kinds of uh, time transformations. One is uh, uh, on your example. So one one is when uh, when exactly does your presentation start? Uh, this should uh, the different uh, times where it could start should be identified if these are just different conventions. And then you have another transformation, which is a sequence of slides in your presentation. The the, the order in which you are showing them. These uh, uh, time steps should not be identified. So I basically propose to distinguish two time transformations and uh, apply the, uh, this uh, uh, reductive <laughs> solution to one of them, but not to another. So in, in the another, you still have the dynamics, and in the first, you have the absence of uh, indeterminism. Yeah, I have to say, I have no idea how to answer your question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, so this was a proposal. <laughs> which can, I'm really uh, sorry. Can reflect on it. Yeah, uh, so let's move to another question by uh, Brian. So partly as a matter of vocabulary, thank you. I'm wondering maybe you should say that you're looking for an ultra local notion of change because you want one that doesn't involve derivatives. And I know philosophers don't all know that word, but it'd probably be good if we learned it. Uh, and that would distinguish what you're looking for from a definition of change in terms of lead derivatives, let's say, which would be my own preference. So I think a local notion of change is already in hand. Uh, and what you're looking for is an ultra local notion, uh, I, apparently in line with Bergson, I guess. Does that seem like a, a friendly way to uh, rephrase what, your project? Well, I, I guess so, yes. Okay, Thank you very much for this distinction. I, I well, to... Ultra local doesn't involve derivatives. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, because um, um, yeah, the usual uh, way to define derivative, uh, at least for velocity, I, I don't think it's a good notion. I have a hard time. The, the more I read about uh, change in time, the more I don't understand what in situation velocity is supposed to be. So um, I guess if uh, yeah, if I can find change without having to use a derivative, I think it would be better. Yeah? Because uh, yeah, yeah, the derivative is a structure that you have to uh, add on top of uh, to do physics. You have to, you have to add, add that on top of your just man, your job bare manifold. But um, uh, yeah, may, may uh, I have to do more about uh, this synthetic differential geometry to see how it's implemented, how different differential geometry is implemented on the manifolds. But uh, if I can have change without having to use um, the derivative, it would be better for me, I guess. Yes. Thank you very much for your comments. I need to think about that a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs> OK, uh, thank you all for, uh, for this discussion. Uh, so either we have uh, some last question, or uh, we finish this experience part. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you very much, Kevin, and I uh, hope uh, your experience was encouraging enough <laughs> so that you continue with making presentations and uh, with your research. So thanks again, everybody, for uh, your uh, participation. <laughs> Goodbye, Brian. And uh, let's uh, continue with uh, Nuria's talk. Uh, let's uh, continue now. I uh, hope everybody has a fun after a short break. And uh, our uh, second speaker today, uh, and the very last, uh, so concluding our meetings, is uh, Nuria Munoz Akanganti, uh, who is uh, at the Mark, Max Planck Institute for the History of Science uh, in Berlin and is currently uh, finishing her visit in Salzburg. So uh, she will, um, she's working with Patricia Palacios, and uh, Kevin is working, was working with, and is working with Alexander Gee. Okay, uh, so uh, Nuria's talk is entitled uh, Inter and Intra Category Forms of Compatibility Between Emergence and Reduction in Philosophy of Science. Uh, so now, uh, Nuria, please begin your talk. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the introduction and for organizing this series of meetings, Valeria. And thank you, everyone, for, for being here. Um, as Valeria said, I will be talking about the compatibility between emergence and reduction and what I've called uh, intercategory compatibility and intracategory compatibility, which I will explain in a bit. And in the end, I will argue for the latter, for intracategory. Um, so just to give you a bit of context for the talk, 
Um, this will be part of my of my thesis, which is a historical research on the condensed matter physicist Philip Anderson, and more specifically on his work on emergence in physics, uh, which he um, presented for the first time in this paper, More is Different, from 1972, which has become like a manifesto for emergence, not only in physics, but also in philosophy of science and philosophy of biology has become very famous. And basically, in this paper, um, the concept of emergence that he presents is one of novelty and unpredictability of properties or behaviors or laws that arise out of the complex interaction between many particle systems. That's why it's called more is different. That's the slogan. Um, and in that paper also, he very clearly um, accepts, the, accepts reductionism. Um, but he says that, um, that reductionism doesn't imply constructivism, which would be um, um, the ability to reduce everything to fundamental laws does not imply the ability to start from those laws and reconstruct the universe. So based on this, we can see that in this paper and like his notion of emergence is, is compatible with that of reductionism. It would not be compatible with this idea of constructing everything from first principles without even knowing where you, where you want to, what you want to achieve. No? Um, but um, curiously, after the 80s or so, which is when he actually became acquainted with the philosophical debates of emergence and reduction, he starts using from time to time the word anti-reductionism to defend or to present his claims. And, and yeah, from the 80s to the 2000s, he will use scattered here and there the word that, that he accepts reductionism, but in other places he would say that his emergentism is a form of anti-reductionism. So there is a bit of confusion in his way of using these terms. Um, and then therefore there's also a bit of confusion in interpreting uh, his idea or his notion of emergence uh, in comparison to, to reductionism. Um, and this is why um, in this talk and which will become hopefully like the last, uh, a part of the uh, last chapter of my thesis, I will study the notion of, comp of compatibility between emergence and reduction um, to hopefully give a better interpretation on, of, of, of Anderson's position. And first of all, let's give some naive definitions of emergence and reduction. I say naive because um, there is a huge taxonomy on these words. And yeah, so here I will just concentrate on what are the main um, concepts that we identify with both emergence and reduction in the literature. Uh, so um, emergence and reduction are relations between two relata. And these relata can be properties or laws, entities or theories. Um, so for example, emergence would be, um, would be um, based on concepts like novelty of these properties or laws or theories, autonomy, um, with respect to um, pro more fundamental properties or laws, universality, which could be also related to, to the notion of multiple realizability in philosophy of mind, robustness, uh, and in, in definitive, like a sort of independence of these pro new properties and laws that emerge out of um, more fundamental properties, laws, or entities, but also some degree of dependency. So it's not a complete, um, um, break from, from the lower level um, laws or entities, but there is a sort of independence and dependence uh, relationship with the substrate. Uh, and reduction um, is uh, associated with notions of deduction, derivability, predictability, explainability, which would be epistemic concepts to relate to laws or to theories. Um, and in a more ontological sense, we could also talk about aggregativity or microphysicalism, which we, would be the idea that all natural phenomena in the end are, are fundamentally constituted by, by microphysical entities. So these are the two notions that we are talking about. And 
Yeah, and now I would like to, to say that emergence and reduction are typically presented in the literature in philosophy of science or philosophy of mind. They are presented as opposed. Um, and I just um, took like a cover of, a, of one of these um, uh, textbooks on emergence and reduction, which you clearly see this opposition, emergence or reduction, one or the other. We cannot have both. Um, in another famous um, text on a recollection of text on emergence by Beda and Humphreys, um, in the introduction, they say irre irreducibility is one of the leading ideas about emergence. So a failure to be reduced often is viewed as a necessary condition for something to be emergence, which would be the idea that I want to challenge and that um, this compatibilism wants to challenge. Um, why? Because there are two main problems with this opposition. One is that it doesn't allow a for a positive definition of emergence. So what I mean by that is that we, it seems that we are defining emergence always um, as a failure of reductionism. So whatever is not reducible then is emergent. And of course, um, it would be better to find uh, ways to define emergence on its own. What does it mean to really capture what we want to say? Um, and also because I think it doesn't account for, for scientists' intuition about emergence, uh, since they majoritarily also accept uh, reductionism. So that's why there has been recent an, an increasing um, interest in reconciling these both terms following especially Jeremy Butterfield, who in 2011 wrote a paper on that, less is different, um, and which we will see in a bit. Um, and so in these recent discussions on, on how to make emergence and reduction compatible, I identify two main forms of compatibilism. One is what I've called intercategory, which would be that is a compatibility between different categories of emergence and reduction. What I mean by categories would be if we are talking more about an, an ontological sense or an epistemological sense of emergence and reduction, for example, um, then intercategory uh, compatibility would be, for example, that uh, an epistemic notion of emergence would be compatible with a, an ontological notion of emergence. And then there could be another option, uh, which I don't think has been really explored, which could be intracategory compatibility. So talking, for example, of um, ontologic emergence compatible with ontologic reductionism. And this idea also implies some sort of complementarity between the two terms. Um, so, and I will argue in the end that although both are interesting and valid to, to defend different types of, of notions of emergence and reduction, intracategory maybe deserves more attention since it seems to be better suited to solve the two above um, problems that I mentioned. Uh, this is the outline for the talk. So that was the introduction. Now we will see more in more detail what I mean by categories of emergence and reduction. We will see the two kinds. Um, and then we will uh, talk about a case study to support my, um, my support uh, to intracategory compatibilism. And then we'll start with some, uh, finish with some conclusions. So in the categories of emergence and reduction, I follow um, a paper by Gay and Sattenaer called A New Look at Emergence or When After is Different because they, they make a very nice classification of all the different types of emergence that um, we can uh, think about. And, and so they give the first six um, types uh, or categories uh, and I included the last two. So the first one, ontological, refers to new laws, powers, or entities. And then in epistemological, it would be related with some uh, degree of unexplainability, underdrivability, or unpredictability of those new laws, powers, entities. Um, then we have the distinction between weak and strong emergence in which, uh, and, and both of them can be given a more epistemic sense and a more ontological sense. So weak, strong emergence in the epistemological sense would be a, a reducibility in principle or in practice of the, of the emergent property. 
Um, and in the more ontological sense, it would be a challenge or not challenge to microphysicalism. So a weak emergent uh, property would not challenge uh, the idea that everything is in the end microphysically constituted and therefore it would not challenge the, the um, causal closure of physics. Um, then there are the other these other two categories, synchronic and diachronic, as uh, Kevin also mentioned, that have to do with uh, time in the sense that synchronic is, um, um, is a, um, a relation between different levels of description at the same time, um, where, while diachronic would be, uh, diachronic emergence would be um, related with the same level, so a property em emerging at the same level of description, but at a different time, at a later time. Um, I have also added the, the um, categories intertheoretic and few many because they will be useful for, for our analysis later. Uh, so intertheoretic would be an emergence um, that uh, comparing two different theories. And few many would be uh, the emergence from, from the many. So a little bit like the sense in which Anderson was speaking about emergence, which would be that new properties emerge when you have many um, uh, components interacting together. And so uh, in the paper, what they do is a very interesting classification like, like this, um, putting all the categories in a cube and then seeing how can they, um, mm, how can they uh, combine with each other so that there are like eight different possible combinations and, and they defend um, a, a view uh, that they call diachronic, weekly and ontological emergence. Diachronic because as we have seen, um, they, um, they analyze system in the, in the same level um, but uh, in a different time. So system one in T1 and the same system, but at a later time would be uh, system two. Uh, it is weak because it doesn't challenge microphysicalism and it's ontological because as they say, the new laws uh, and properties that emerge in C system two uh, are forbidden by the laws that were governing uh, the same system, but uh, at a previous time T1. And um, just uh, as they do this classification of categories for emergence, I thought that we could also do the same for reduction, although uh, there are some nuances. They don't translate um, perfectly to each other. Um, so uh, ontological and epistemological is quite similar. So ontological would be talking about a constitution and causation and micro microphysicalism. And epistemological, it will be talking about um, explainability, so the ability of explain and derive um, um, or predict um, the, the properties from, from, from more fundamental properties. In weak and strong, I don't think there's a perfect um, translation um, because I don't think there's a weak and strong um, ontological sense in which like you can be strongly microphysicalist or weakly microphysicalist. But in the epistemic sense, we could see that weak would be that the emergent property is reducible only in principle, and that strong would be that the emergent property is reducible also in practice. In the synchronic and diachronic distinction, um, I also don't think it makes sense to see it in a temporal way because I don't think reduction is a matter of time. But, um, but we can talk about an, uh, a reduction between descriptions in different levels, or we could talk about a reduction uh, of properties at the same level. And intertheoretic, the same reduction uh, of properties between theories and few many. Uh, if, we, if we consider a few many reduction, it would be um, that we can successfully extrapolate the behavior of the many just from the behavior of a few particles. Okay, so now um, we will start the, the part on intercategory category compatibilism. And for that, we will start with um, Butterfield, um, Jeremy Butterfield's paper, Less is Different, which, uh, as I said, um, really started this conversation in philosophy of science to try to make uh, these terms compatible. 
although there had been previous accounts of that, but this really became um, like uh, it gave momentum for, for these views. Um, so in this paper, um, he, he says, for my main point of view will be that although emergence is usually opposed to reduction, many examples exhibit both. So my title, Less is Different, is meant as an identic combination of the two parties' slogans. Here, by two parties, uh, he's talking about the emergentist side and the reductionist side. And, and, and he, said that, he says that the emergentist side is represented by, by Anderson, this condensed matter physicist who wrote more is different, as I was telling you, and the reductionist side by Steven Weinberg, a particle phys physicist um, known for, for, for um, having uh, dreams of, of finding final theories. And so he, uh, uh, just a uh, uh, we, um, quick parenthesis, I would like to say that this opposition um, between emergence and reduction should not be seen as an opposition between Anderson and Weinberg, because uh, Anderson and Weinberg uh, had a debate on, um, on, on the, a very particular debate on the construction of a, of a superconducting super collider in the 80s, uh, in which they had different views. So in that, in that particular debate, they had uh, op opposed views about whether they should build this superconducting super collider or not. But I don't think that their opposition was um, because they uh, represent these two sides of emergence and reduction that should be seen as opposed. Because as I said, I do think that Anderson still accepts reductionism. So it's, it's not that he should represent some anti-reductionism. Um, but having said that, let's go back to, to Jeremy Butterfield's um, paper in which um, he presents emergence and reduction um, um, like that. So emergence would be novel, novelty and robustness from the composite system with respect to its components. And from the limiting system, like when you take uh, the thermodynamic limit um, with respect to the finite system. And for him reduction, uh, he takes a Nagelian account of reduction based on deduction, but also including some bridge principles linking the two theories vocabularies. And in the paper, he, he says that there are um, examples that exhibit both emergence and reduction in the way that he has defined them. Uh, one of the examples would be phase transitions in which he says that uh, the emergent behavior, so, it, so in phase transitions, basically the problem uh, in terms of categorizing it as emergent or, redu or um, re a reduction is that they are only um, describable uh, once you take the, 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 the limit to infinite components because uh, the transition occurs uh, when some thermodynamic variables uh, tend to infinity or they have non-analyticities -analy and this can only be recovered when you take the thermodynamic limit. So um, in, in this case, Jeremy says that, um, that the emergent behavior can be deduced, so in his sense of deduction, only after taking the limit. So in this sense, it would be a, reduc a successful reduction, even though it's only after taking the thermodynamic limit, um, but that uh, the emergent behavior also occurs before taking the limit, so for, for a finite system. So that he would say that even though, um, for example, a phase transition of a ferromagnet, even though um, the sharp transition from magnetization um, on uh, minus one, for example, to plus one, can only be defined for um, sharply for an infinite system, he would say that if you have a very large but still finite system, you still have a, um, a, um, a quite sharp um, um, change of sudden change of magnetization. So this is his idea of compatibility. And then uh, John Norton, in this uh, paper called Confusions of a Reduction and Emergence in the Physics of Phase Transitions, he takes the idea of Jeremy Butterfield and he makes an important point uh, and that we will see now. Um, so he says, what I add to Butterfield's analysis is that the reconciliation must take note 
of the multiple senses of levels of, of levels invoked and the fact that the parties in contention refer to different levels. So uh, here, when Norton talks about levels, it's what I've called categories. Um, and so the, the, the two parties in contention here, so basically Norton is talking about physicists and philosophers who tend to uh, see phase transitions differently. Um, and so physicists on the one side, um, Norton says that they divide scientific knowledge according to scale, and therefore they see phase transitions as successful cases of emergence. Um, and he says that their, their sense of emergence here would be this few many emergence. So the fact that the, 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 the property, the, the emergent property in this case of a phase transition, like the appearance of a sudden magnetization in a ferromagnet, uh, only uh, appears when you go from few components to, to, uh, to many, to an infinite system. But on the other hand, philosophers, Norton says, divide scientific knowledge into theories. And therefore, uh, they see phase transition as successful reduction, which he calls interthoretic inter reduction, which is the idea that you can um, reduce, uh, successfully um, reduce uh, the emergent properties between theories by taking, even if you are taking limits or approximations. So he, he ends up saying that emergence and reduction are only compatible because they relate different levels of description. So what I've called, because they relate different categories of emergence and reduction, what I've called intercategoric. So from here, um, we can already have a couple of questions. Uh, for example, is it true that philosophers only care about relating theories and physicists only divide knowledge um, into scale? Um, when talking about emergence and reduction? And also, is it true that emergence and reduction can only be compatible when referring to different categories? Um, and, and before answering this and going to see um, this other notion that I've called intracategory compatibilism, before that, uh, let's just see another alternative to compatibilism to solve the, this opposition between emergence and reduction that I introduced in the beginning. This alternative uh, was given by Karen Krauser in a paper in 2015 called the coupling emergence and reduction in physics. And yeah, basically her aim is to decouple both terms and not speak about reduction when we are speaking about emergence because it brings all these sort of confusions no? and defining emergence in terms of failures of reduction. And she bases her, her analysis in, of emergence in effective field theories, which are uh, theories that capture the relevant physics at a given length or energy scale and presents us with a tower of theories ordered, ordered hierarchically according to energy scale. And so for her, emergence in the case of um, effective field theories is understood as novelty and autonomy of the, of the levels, so of the high, uh, higher levels uh, with respect to the lower levels, without reference to concepts associated with reduction between levels or deduction or derivation. Uh, emergence is then given a positive definition, not one in terms of failure of reduction. The benefits and disadvantages I see in Crowder's proposal is that it clarifies um, maybe phys physicist intuition about, about the essential features of emergence in, in these particular cases where systems are described by theories depending on scale. But it also it doesn't provide a similar understanding of reduction in those cases, which I still is, uh, which I think is still relevant for physicists. Like I still think that physicists would like to talk about reduction uh, when talking about emergence. So, so far to recap, we have, been, we have seen two options to dissolve this opposition between emergence and reduction. The first one by Norton and Jeremy, which is separating, um, uh, separating the categories to which they refer. And the, the other one is separating the concepts altogether, like with Crowder, like the coupling, emergence and reduction. The problems that I see with one uh, is that um, emergence would still be defined as a failure of reduction 
of the same category, right? So um, if you still want to defend an ontological claim of emergence, you would still define it as a failure of an ontological reduction. And the, um, so the, the compatibilism is not quite complete. And the problems I see with two is that, as I said, a physicist might still be interested in talking about reduction when, while talking about emergence. Uh, and so I see that there could be a third option, which is, is there a way to make emergence and reduction compatible for the same category at the same level, what I've called intra-category? And to defend that, first, I will very briefly um, go through two accounts uh, of two authors, Samuel Alexander and Aaron Snagel, which I think um, um, can be seen as, as, um, as examples of uh, what, I'm, um, um, what I'm describing as intra-category compatibilism. And I will just use them to, to inspire a little bit this, this idea, and then we will go to a to a more precise example uh, in physics, which will be the symmetry breaking in superconductivity. Um, uh, you have uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Okay, yeah, then I will be very brief on Samuel Alexander. I Basically, what I want to say about him is that I believe that in his metaphysics, Samuel Alexander was one of the first uh, proponents of emergence uh, belonging to, to the British emergentists um, who were um, who um, presented the, and, and defined the concept in the in the late 19th century. And in Alexander's view, I think that emergence and reduction are naturally compatible. So for him, um, um, he, he has a metaphysical picture of the world in which uh, space-time is the most fundamental uh, substance. So he's monist about space-time, which as Kevin has said, we should abandon this view maybe. Um, but basically uh, for him, even though he's monist about uh, this substance uh, of space-time, he sees that uh, things can differentiate from space-time and emerge from it. Um, through the different constellations of, of uh, space-time points or point instance. Um, so basically emergence is for him very embedded in his metaphysical picture of how the universe creates novel entities from the same substance. But at the same time, he says that even uh, emergent qualities are, are new, they are also reducible or expressible without residue in terms of the processes proper to the level from which they emerge because for him, the different levels uh, are compressed to one another. Um, so basically um, to, um, to go quickly on this, uh, I would say that uh, this, this notion that emergence and reduction would be so naturally compatible already challenges a little bit the, the narrative of this long-standing opposition between emergence and reduction, since for him, for example, one of the first proponents of emergence they were, they were not opposite. Um, and it also challenges the idea that emergence and reduction can only be compatible when referring to different categories. And the second example is Snagel, um, which, uh, who very famously um, wrote um, a lot about reduction uh, in his book, The Structure of Science of 1961. Um, so also uh, quickly, his model of reduction is an intertheoretic concept of deduction between theories, um, uh, between a high level often discovered earlier theory uh, from a low level and often posterior theory. And it can also include uh, some bridge laws or auxiliary assumption that link the concepts in the different theories, which tend to be different, like microscopic concepts with microscopic concepts. When you need these bridge laws to, to uh, have a successful reduction between theories is what he calls ater an heterogeneous reduction. And then after uh, all his discussion on, on the reduction, he has a, a, a section on emergence in which he says that uh, emergence should be also um, construed as a thesis concerning only logical relationships between statements and theories. So not about properties or entities or inherent traits of objects. 
And so an emergent trait is not an absolute thing, but, but it's relative to a theory. Um, he also says, interestingly, that, uh, that emergence should not be seen as a temporary confession of our ignorance. And that, uh, and this is the important point, that the necessity of uh, including these breach laws and independent assumptions in order for deduction to be successful is perhaps the central thesis in the doctrine of emergence. So what I take this to mean is that for him, the fact that uh, different uh, theories uh, use different concepts is, uh, is the, the, the lesson that, that we have to take from emergence, no? Like, that, uh, like this, this um, heterogeneous uh, um, reduction would include uh, his, his um, account on emergence which would be represented by this necessity of using these bridge laws. Um, so I also see this as an example of um, intra-category compatibility, which would be between inter-theoretic emergence and inter-theoretic reduction, which would be sort of embedded in, in each other. And now, um, as I said, these two examples serve as an inspiration to, 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 to think about another model of compatibilism between same category. And in the following, we will see an example and discuss its benefits. So we will be talking about the symmetry breaking in superconductivity. And so the, the characteristics uh, that are, um, uh, the characteristic properties of, of a superconductor, which are the zero electrical res resistance and the flux quantization and the Meissner effect. So the expulsion of magnetic field from the superconductor can be explained um, in two different um, levels. One macroscopically uh, with the Ginzburg-Landau theory from 1950 and microscopically by the bardeen cooper schrieffer theory, which I will be referring to BCS from 1957. Uh, both these theories can be treated as effective field theories uh, that we have seen before when talking about Crowther's paper. Uh, because they start from a low energy uh, equation already, or lower energy Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, and they are able to explain these main uh, properties of superconductivity independently from the high energy degrees of freedom. Um, to just see a bit the difference between these two theories, um, let's see the different assumptions that they take. So the Ginzburg-Landau theory would be more of a top-down approach, in which the, the, um, the, super con uh, the, the transition of, of the metal into the superconducting state is seen as a, is a, described as a second order phase transition. So the free energy near the transition is given by an expansion around um, a complex order parameter psi, which is non-zero below the critical temperature Tc. And so this free energy F is expressed by, uh, expresses a, a Mexican hot potential um, that uh, would explain the symmetry breaking um, for, for when this order parameter is um, non-zero, so for the superconducting phase. And this symmetry breaking um, would explain the appearance of a gap in the energy of the superconductor, which then is related to, to all the basic properties that superconductors have. Uh, on the other hand, the BCS theory, which is more of a bottom-up approach, uh, sees all these prop can explain all these properties from a more microscopic perspective. So the main assumption is that below TC, um, electrons and phonons become interacting more relevantly. And, they, and through the interaction of a phonon, uh, electrons get paired into what it's called Cooper pairs. And Cooper pairs, since they are bosons and not fermions, they can condensate. Uh, and then this uh, order parameter that we were seeing in Ginzburg-Landau is seen actually as the state of, of, of these Cooper pairs. Um, and then in the superconducting phase is non-zero. So it's when the phase transition would happen. Um, and then um, the, for the superconducting phase, the, the, the phase of, of this um, Cooper pair state gets a fixed value, which then is what explains the symmetry breaking, which is 
the U1 electromagnetic gauge symmetry breaking, which also is represented by this uh, Mexican hat potential. And now with this, um, um, what I would like to do is try to relate and see the difference between the two theories to claim that they are both an example of uh, interthoretic emergence and interthoretic reduction. So what I will mean by interthoretic reduction of a theory T1 to T2, so T1 would be uh, the reduced theory and T2 the reducing theory. Um, what I consider to be a successful uh, reduction would be a derivation of T1 from T2, in which it can include taking limits and, or approximations. Also, um, an explanation of the concepts in T1 from concepts in T2. And also that through the, the reduction, or th thanks to the, to the reducing theory T2, there is a consolidation of knowledge or a prediction of new knowledge related to, to that phenomenon. Um, and then for, for the case of interthoretic emergence of T1 from T2, I would say that there has to be some sense of autonomy of, of the reduced theory with respect to, to, to the reducing theory. And, and that there are novel concepts of predictions that only arise at the level of T1 with respect to T2. And so in this sense, I, I see uh, my claims for in, uh, interthoretic reduction between the Ginzburg-Landau approach and the BCS would be that the Ginzburg-Landau theory can be derived actually from the BCS theory. So close to the critical temperature, the Ginzburg-Landau arises as an effective uh, theory of the macroscopic scale, which was already uh, shown by Gorkov uh, only two years after the proposal of the BCS theory. Um, also, um, in terms of the better explanation of concepts and linking of concepts between the two, I would say that the BCS theory brought a microscopical explanation of, of uh, the concepts in the Kingsburg Landau. So the order parameter uh, was explained in terms of the Cooper pair state. Um, the gap then um, is the, um, actually the, the, um, the sum of the binding energies of these pairs of electrons when entering into in this state. And the Meissner effect, which is the expulsion of magnetic field, is also explained microscopically by um, the, the, the electromagnetic field uh, being coupled to short range um, um, photons in the, in the interior of the, of the superconductor. And also, apart from that, apart from explaining better the, the, all the mechanisms of a superconductor, um, it also provided a more detailed explanation of a wider uh, range of phenomena, for example, the Josephson effect. Um, uh, in the analogy to the QED va vacuum, how could massive fermions arise from a QED vacuum? And it also ended up in the formalization of the nambu goldstone theorem and also of the Higgs mechanism. But at the same time, I think it's also a successful case of intertheoretic emergence between, uh, between the Ginsburg-Landau and BCS because the basic properties of superconductivity were already well described by the phenomenological laws of Ginsburg-Landau. So uh, it's sort of autonomous and independent from the, from the microscopical details of the BCS theory. It's actually an effective field theory with respect to it. And also there's an important uh, thing that um, there's also the phenomenon of high temperature superconductivity in which the, the superconductor actually arrives this state but at a higher temperature than, than usual. And, and, and this high temperature superconductivity can be described phenomenologically using a GL Ginsburg-Landau-like theory, but it's not at all explainable microscopically by the BCS theory. And this is seen as one of the main constraints uh, of the BCS theory. So to conclude, um, I see that the case of um, superconductivity and especially related to its symmetry breaking can be seen as an example of uh, intracategory compatibility uh, between emergence and reduction. And in this, this account, um, a successful instance of reduction actually can also be seen as a better way to understand why the phenomenon is emergent. So in a way, both concepts become sort of complementary, as in Nagel's account. 
a little bit, and which I think fits uh, with some physicist intuition about emergence, especially with Anderson's. And I would like to conclude with this quote of Anderson, um, where he's, I, I forgot the, the reference, but, but it's from a book of his in of 2011, where he says, in physics, the two great reductionist discoveries were the renormalization program and the concept of broken symmetry as introduced into particle theory by Nambu and Weinberg. Um, each of these two developments can be seen conversely as starting from simple and more symmetric underlying theories of the substrate and making different and more complicated emergent entities from them. Thus, the idea of emergence and reduction are simply two sides of the same coin philosophically. And to conclude, we have seen that there are two approaches in dissolving the opposition between emergence and reduction. One is to make them compatible at different categories. The other is to decouple them and still not talk about reduction when discussing emergence. And I have proposed that there could be a third option, which I've called intracategory compatibilism, which I have exemplified with the case of symmetry breaking in superconductivity. In this account, both emergence and reduction become complementary and not opposed to each other. And the benefits from this account are that it frees us from defining emergence as a failure of reduction, and it better aligns with some physicists' intuitions about emergence. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. That's so really good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed this. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so uh, yeah, we um, we are waiting for some questions, and uh, I would like to start with mine because <laughs> otherwise I will uh, forget them and so on. Uh, so um, you can um, keep the slides if you want. Um, so. Maria, yeah, I liked very much uh, because we had some discussion about how to, how to organize this talk and I think it is a success uh, uh, then. So, um, because it is uh, structured, it is centered on ideas, uh, it has examples as at the end, but also uh, uh, in the previous parts of your talk. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think it uh, was good. Uh, thanks to you and to Patricia for uh, having ensured that. Um, so, um, just uh, two remarks and a question. Uh, so uh, when you were speaking about um, forms of uh, categories of reduction, which are based on categories of emergence, you transpose them to reduction. And uh, um, when you're speaking about synchronic and diachronic reduction, uh, I was puzzled by the fact that uh, time disappeared, just like in uh, Kevin's talk, <laughs> because you were uh, Mm, explaining them in terms of uh, uh, there was something about series, but uh, the, uh, the time qualifications disappeared. It was strange because synchronic and diachronic is primarily about the about time and not about series. Uh, while for emergence, you had both uh, characterizations. Uh, so second. Uh, um, I'm not familiar with the details of current uh, 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 approach, but uh, from how you presented it, it looked uh, to me that she's envisaging a third option, and it consists in that uh, two series are independent because both reduction and emergence uh, seem kinds of dependencies. So they, they postulate some links between two series, which, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, the third option is to consider them as independent, unrelated, and so on. So that uh, was a possibility, perhaps, that kind of makes, but, or which is was considered anyway. anyway. Uh, okay, and uh, the question, um, I, you were, uh, for your example, at the last part of your talk, you were concentrating on um, why is this is a case of emergence and why is this a case of reduction? But I I, uh, have, um, I didn't notice it uh, to be spelled out. Why is this a case of intercategory uh, emergence and reduction? Why it is it within the same category? Okay. Um, to the first question. Um, yeah. So I I removed the time sense just because I don't understand why something uh, like a process would be reducible just by like moving it through time. That's why I just kept the, the intra-level or inter-level distinction. Yeah, it depends on how, um, 
I mean, the idea of the, of transporting the classification is the, uh, the underlying thought is uh, the link between emergency reduction. Uh, the, your idea of uh, that the, uh, reduction is uh, the converse of emergence, which you which you um, reject afterwards. But I mean, when you address uh, the categories, you are still within this paradigm of reduction being yeah. the inverse of emergence. And then time, if it is in the emergence, then it should also be in the reduction. So we, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I understand. Yeah, actually, I, I, I didn't want to give the impression that I think that there is a, a transpose of all the concepts of emergence into reduction, but I, I just wanted to use uh, the concepts in which we are familiar to talk about emergence reduction, which some of them are, you can transpose them and some of them not. Um, um, as the case of, of the diachronic and synchronic reduction, which I don't Yeah, perhaps you just uh, need to say that, uh, and here we cannot transpose. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I should have been more clear about that. Um, also, then you asked me about Crowder. Uh, so can, the, the third yeah. option was, uh, so emergence reduction, but also independence. Independence between emergence and reduction. No, yes. uh, no, it depends between uh, the things which could have been uh, emergent or adapted. Uh, so like two series, ontologically it's more difficult, but if you have two series, you can have one emergent from another one reduced to another, or they can be independent. That's the third option. Right, but I think that Crowder doesn't defend that since she precisely bases her account on, on effective field theories. So uh, for her precisely, there is an idea of dependency of the theories, but also so independency and dependency at the same time of the theories. So it would be a more um, weak sense of emergence for her. Okay, and the third? And the third one? Can uh, you? So, yeah. Can uh, you so why, why, why was this uh, the. Um, why was it uh, in the same level? Ah, right. Uh, because I, I, I um, so what I want to say is that uh, I, I relate uh, the Ginsburg-Landau uh, theory with the BCS theory. So I see it as a case of inter-theoretic emergence or reduction. It's in the same way because uh, uh, both are about uh, two series, right? Right, because when I'm okay. talking about, yeah, that's why I changed the name and I'm not talking about levels and I'm talking about categories. Uh, because as I said, when Norton says that um, uh, com compatibility is achieved because of talking of different levels, he means different levels of description. Like uh, philosophers are talking about theories, uh, physicists are talking about difference in scale, and that's what I've called categories. So you can be talking about that uh, in terms of ontology, in terms of uh, more epistemological claims. And the claim that I wanted to make is about relation between theories, so inter-theoretic emergence or reduction. And there could be more combination. So uh, the, 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 the summary of it all is that uh, by doing this, uh, I want to open the possibility of even more combinations of compatibility between emergence and reduction. Okay, uh, that was clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let's continue with Alexander, and uh, if anyone else has a question, please raise your hand. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm a little bit confused because it seems to me that your, def your way to understand emergence is very generous. So, if I have novelty of concept and certain kind of autonomy, but a certain theoretical dependence, it's emergent. It's the way I understand your definition. So why should I not say that thermodynamical phenomena are emergent on statistical mechanics? Classical physics is emergent on quantum mechanics. Uh, chemistry is emergent on the physics. Biology is emergent on biochemistry. So is your definition including all that? And if yes, why do you need emergence? You know, if if everything is emergent, what's the point? So that was Alexander and all the founders trying to find a, a middle ground between duality and uh, and yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you. So first of all, of course, I think that I need to think further into my definition of emergence. Um, um, 
because it's true what you say that it, it can include all these um, uh, relations between thermodynamics to statistical mechanics and all of the, that you said. But actually, I wanted to be as, as um, fair with Anderson's account as possible. And actually, Anderson sees classical mechanics as emergent from quantum mechanics. He sees thermodynamics as emergent from statistical mechanics. Uh, that's why I wanted, I mean, I understand the problems of being so generous philosophically. But at the same time, what I'm trying to do here, um, uh, which is included in my historical research, is to find a way to better understand Anderson, or at least, even if it's not a good philosophical position, at least to, to be clear on what he uh, was thinking, so that maybe um, you, you would not end up with uh, philosophical interpretations of Anderson in which he's an anti-reductionist all of a sudden. Um, so that's what that's why I think my definition was so generous. Although I admit that maybe I also have to give it a bit more thought. So it's it's an historical okay. It's an his historical thesis. Yes, yes, my thesis. Yes, yes. Although in this chapter, since I wanted to um, talk about this, uh, I needed to go um, to do a more philosophical approach. But yeah. Okay, uh, if Alexander is satisfied that we have a question from Adriel, uh, Adriel, please ask it. Hi, Nuria. Thanks so much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question, and I apologize for, for my ignorance in the field, so, but, but thank you for explaining it. It was, it was all very, very clear. And I guess, I guess my, my first impression uh, I think your emergence of reductionism is, I think the conclusion is right that they are both complementary. And, and certainly that would have been my initial thought about it in the sense that I see both as quite hierarchical in their definitions and assuming different levels on the basis of which um, something might be emerged. So it, it was interesting to kind of think that there is an opposition that seems to exist within the literature um, and it, it sounds like that opposition does stem with that particular concern that i think you raised the one about uh, perhaps emergence being a failure of reductionism and so that's interesting to think with um, but i think the conclusion that you've drawn is 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 at least on, on my intuition i think uh, one that seems to to fit better um, I guess it, it also very much depends on, on, on the ways in which these two definitions would be interpreted. So, uh, or the, the definitions that would be given for each of them, in which, to what extent does the literature basically hold emergentism and reductionism as exclusionary of one another? Because it sounds like what you're doing is the definition that you're drawing is, is something of emerge that does not exclude one from the other. Um, so in the opposition, sorry, this is a long question, but in the opposition that you've set out in the beginning, to what extent does that literature really seek to exclude a property of reductionism uh, from their definition of emergentism? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, actually, this is something that I would also like to investigate because um, a little bit also the message from the talk, I would like to be that actually this, this, this idea of long-standing opposition between emergence and reduction is not so true. And I don't think that, the, for example, I think that for, for Alexander and Nagel, they, they hadn't, they, 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 they didn't see emergence as a priori opposed to reduction or that they would exclude each other. At some point, it's true that in the literature um, of philosophy of science, and I think especially of philosophy of mind, they started to be seen as opposed. And this, I, I haven't had the time to really investigate how this opposition really uh, came about. Um, but I do think that, that, the, that in the philosophy of mind, especially they are more, um, more inclined to, or more interested about metaphysical or ontological claims uh, of emergence and reduction, since they are you know, um, um, interested in knowing if the mind is emergent from, from, the, from the body and in which sense. And I think in, in those debates is where the opposition uh, between the two really started to, 
to, to gain force. And, and in a way, we have sort of edited this idea that they should be opposed, which I think that we should um, um, get rid of. Not because um, having them as opposed is not interesting for some views, but we should explore more combinations and more, um, yeah, more combinations between the two. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Patricia, you have a question in the last, oh no, we have two persons for the last minute. Uh, so who is first? Do we have time? Uh, one minute at least. We should not be late, as I said in the beginning. Just very, but, very uh, short uh, question. We, uh, yeah, let's try with both persons. So begin, Patricia, please. Just a very short question. So follow up of Alexandre's question. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how liberal your definition is, actually. I don't think it allows everything because you say that emergence needs to fulfill two claims, a dependency claim and an independency claim. And that separates emergent from other notions like dualism, for example, which doesn't fulfill the dependency claim. So I think I don't see it as a very liberal definition. So how, how liberal do you think your definition is in the end? Yeah, actually, um, I haven't included the dependency claim here. So it's true that uh, maybe um, in the way I put it in, in, in this slide, it doesn't include the, the dependency claim. But yeah, I do think that it doesn't include dualism for sure. But maybe yes, these distinctions that Alexander was saying uh, of um, emergence of classical mechanics from quantum mechanics uh, or thermodynamics from from um, from statistical mechanics. I do think that the, it might include those, uh, even if they are also seen as, as successful uh, inter-theoretic reductions at the same time. So maybe you can make that notion more precise by specifying yeah. what novelty means and what this dependency thesis means in yeah. each case, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Okay, and we have Christian with uh, Sebastian, I don't know. Uh, well, uh, Christian first, please, uh, quickly. Okay, okay. Uh, Nuria, many thanks for, for the talk. It was really, really great. Uh, and my question is more or less related to what uh, Alexander and uh, Patricia just said. Um, I mean, I, I am very sympathetic with the idea that uh, reduction and emergence can be uh, combined in, in some cases. But, what, what, but when you start to relax the concepts, the reduction concept or the emerging concept, it's not so clear what is the motivation to introduce the concept. And, and you have to, to go two to ways. One way to say, well, I mean, people use the concept of emerging, uh, the concept of reduction, and we want to give a nice approach that recover or capture how people use the concept, that, that's fine. But the other way is, okay, we want to know if there are this kind of relation in the world or, or if we need philosophically this relation. And I, what, what, what my, my, my concern is that when you start to relax the concepts, it's not so clear where's the motivation to introduce emergence as a, a substantive relation in the world. Because one of the ideas is that you need some uh, uh, novelty, some it could be spelled out in terms of some causal novelty or some power or whatever, and that, that's clear. But in, in this case, in, in this particular case, and in, in, the, in, the, in the case that you, you, you described, it's not clear to me why if you have real reduction, that's, as you said, as you say here, you also need emergence. And what, what, what is the, the real novelty that is being there and why is not captured by production or why is production not, not, not capturing in an interesting sense this novelty is there is some novelty. So what is the motivation to, in this particular case, to introduce uh, emergence? Right, um, thank you. Um, so I guess that the, the, the novelty here um, is that uh, for the case of the Ginsburg Landau, you can, actually um, explain some concepts or uh, explain some behaviors that you cannot explain uh, with the microscopic theory of BCS. So I think that the novelty uh, in, in, my, in my case study is um, reflected on this part. 
the autonomy is reflected on the part that uh, that the Ginsburg Lando would be an effective field theory from the from the BCS, and in this way, and this is the the independency uh, claim. Um, and the novelty, I think that uh, I wanted to capture it um, through through this idea that there are still some some behaviors that the BCS cannot uh, account for and cannot explain. So that it would show that there, there's a further independency of the microscopic details in this case, maybe. Okay, and uh, we have uh, the last minute for Sebastian. Very quickly, uh, a quick follow-up question, like uh, after like Alexander, Patricia, and Christian. Uh, it seems to me that your uh, concept of emergence is also not not too liberal, but maybe like the opposite criticism would be it's too close to what Jeremy uh, is doing. You know, Jeremy Butterfield. It's like it seems that your sense of autonomy and novelty is very close to what Jeremy was doing. And of course, like one of the main tool uh, used by Jeremy was like the, the real organization group, like the RG. So maybe like, uh, so the question would be like, you know, how, what would be the kind of tool that you would use to specify your concept of autonomy to make it distinct uh, from Jeremy in a way? Is it some kind of like multiple reliability uh, where you have, you have like a space of models and you can see that they all give you the same order parameter that you would get in the BS, BS, BCS sorry, theory, or is it something else? Like, if you had to, to, to just tell us quickly, like as a very last minute question, what kind of tool would you use to specify your concept of autonomy? What would it be? Okay, um, so yeah, maybe I would need to think more about that. Uh, at the same time, I, I don't see a, a problem with it being close to Jeremy's account, uh, but um, is, so I think that it would be actually closer to, to Crowther's uh, concept of autonomy uh, that she extracts from, from effective field theories. So the, the, the autonomy would be like this sort of insensibility to microscopic details or high energy details, quickly said. So if I may, just one second. I, I think Jeremy emphasizes novelty and robustness more than autonomy. Yeah, yeah, wrong. yeah. So. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, could you have a last remark? Yeah. Uh, I think I, I wanted to, to uh, look at Gaudensi. Uh, ah, yes, yes. But very quickly, please. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, it, it was just... Um, uh, just trying to to understand whether Nuria, you're you're actually perhaps one way of putting would be would be that uh, rather than perhaps speaking strictly of uh, reduction and emergence, the fact that the effective the, the effective and microscopic versions of a theory in a certain sense are both uh, have, have uh, they cooperate in a certain sense eff effectively into 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 like I don't know for heuristic purposes or for for uh, for explan explanatory purposes and so on and so forth. So at the end, they are actually uh, they are actually kind of uh, yeah intertwined with, with each other. So even if you reduce, even if, or even if you only consider the emergent level, at the end, these two things are so intertwined in practice that at the end there is not even point to 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 say uh, you know uh, yes, what is the virtue of of each single one we separated from the other? I, I don't know. It's just a, just a kind of a thinking along. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, I think this is definitely in line with what Anderson uh, thinks about this. Um, and, and yeah, I would also like to reflect this by, by make it, making it more uh, philosophically um, clear. And I, I think that this uh, is the, the objective that I'm trying to, to reach here. Um, but yeah, so I will work further on that to try to make this point clear. As you said, I, I really like this idea that you said that they both cooperate in this sort of heuristic uh, sense, no? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you all very much. Uh, I'm happy that I had a uh, present. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we had some discussion, uh, yeah, active discussion of this uh, case as well. Uh, so um, thanks to Nuria, uh, thanks again to uh, Kevin, 
Uh, yeah, it was uh, uh, great to have finished uh, in this positive way. I hope for everybody. Uh, so uh, thank you all for having attended uh, this meeting or the others uh, and uh, the others for some. Uh, so um, the video uh, as uh, with the previous talks will be available normally uh, at the Surfaces YouTube uh, channel in uh, some time. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, this, uh, these events were uh, to foster collaboration or at least to show some of the convergence of interest between uh, Zazwork and uh, 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 uh groups and uh, even beyond. Uh, so uh, yeah, I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope our uh, contacts will continue in some other way and uh, we will uh, have uh, an occasion in some time to see the development of all the research which was presented at this meeting. So thank you all again. Thank you.